Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Prairie and Native Plant Careers. Today, you will learn from three professionals whose knowledge of and training in prairie and native plants has shaped their careers. The panelists are Sarah Kendrick, mi Migratory Birds Biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Rhonda Burnett, Community Conservation Planner with the Missouri Department of Conservation, and Jared Hubner, Director of Prairie Management for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. They will share the education, training, and skills that are important for their current positions with the aim of helping young professionals or anyone interested in, work, in working with prairie and native plants as a profession. My name is Erica Van Brinken. I'm the Outreach and Special Projects Coordinator for the Foundation, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen, and at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to the panelists. Since there are multiple presenters today, please indicate if your question is intended for a particular, pre particular presenter or for all. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now I will turn it over to migratory birds biologist, Sarah Kendrick. Thanks, Erica, and thanks, Carol, um, to everybody for having me today. I will try and go really fast. I got to put on my timer here so I don't go over time. So as Erica said, I'm Sarah Kendrick. I am a migratory bird biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. The reason that you see MDC's logo on the screen is that a lot, a few of the projects I'm going to talk about today, I did in that role. So I wanted to give credit to the agency that supported me. But a lot of the work that I did previously in that role, I still do today. So I'll just walk you through a little bit of my background. So again, I'm Sarah. I was born and raised in Missouri. Um, I have a little bit of a windy path when it comes to my career in that I have an English undergrad degree, which may not track too much with other natural resource professionals, but I was 19 years old and I didn't know what the heck to do with life. And so people had told me I was good at writing. So I picked English. Um, but in the end, it kind of came around to help me in natural resources. I found I graduated. I did a student conservation association. That's SCA internship. And then I did an AmeriCorps stint for a year with the stream team program. So I did two internships in AmeriCorps with natural resources, realized that's what I wanted to do. I went back to the University of Missouri. Um, to take coursework to maybe be a naturalist at a national park. I took ornithology and I was completely hooked. I loved it more than anything else I'd ever studied before. I couldn't wait to go to class. Everything I learned, I was just so excited about. And it really lit a spark inside me that I really didn't know was there. We'd always spent time in the outdoors, but this was just a subset of natural resources that I just really loved. So then I spoke to my TA in ornithology, did some field work with birds here in Missouri with Acadian flycatchers. That's me in my first field season. I couldn't really believe that you got paid money to go look for bird nests and monitor them through, through the summer, but it's true. You can do that by doing field work. Then I went to Fort Hood in Texas and worked with endangered golden cheek warblers, uh, banning them, nest monitoring, finding their nests. And then I finally got into a master's program in fisheries and wildlife at the University of Missouri. Um, studying eastern wood peewees across savannah woodland restoration sites in Missouri. I also did winter point counts. So then I worked for Mizzou, crunched some of that data, and worked to publish my uh, master's research. I finally got my foot in the door at the conservation department doing uh, a wildlife program supervisor job, which I know by title doesn't tell you anything, but it was more of an outreach and marketing coordinator. So not really what I had envisioned going in down the biologist road, but um, I think being flexible is really important. And really, I don't think I would have gotten that job if I hadn't had an English undergrad degree. So it kind of came full cir circle for me there. Did that for four years. And then I got my dream job of the state ornithologist with the conservation department, where I did a lot of fun things, worked with a lot of great people, did that for four years. And then just last year, got the opportunity to apply for a Fish and Wildlife Service migratory bird biologist position. I've only been in this role for about five months, so still pretty early but getting to do a lot of the fun stuff that I did before with MDC in Missouri and across the region, since this position is a regional eight state um, level job. So trying to broaden that scope of influence. So I just wanna walk through really quickly, really quickly, a few of the projects that I'm working on. So the MODIS wildlife tracking system uses tiny radio transmitting uh, tags that you put on our small migratory birds to track them across large hemispheric distances. So MODIS in itself is a project of Birds Canada. 
It's a collaborative research system that works off of these tiny radio transmitters that fit our smallest migratory birds, and then an array of semi-permanent MODIS receivers placed across the landscape that weighs, wait for a MODIS tagged bird or bat or large insect to pass within range. And the cool thing is that they all work on the same frequency. So here you see a map of active MODIS receivers across the world. It's a global effort. All of them work on the same frequency. And so here's our Swainson's thrush. I don't know why it doesn't have any feet, but here it is wearing a tag. This is the bird with the tag. Here's our MODIS station. It's just antennas, coax, and a receiver. Here's our bird flying within range of the receiver. Oh, it was detected, and that detection is captured uh, and uploaded to the MODIS website. These are the yellow active MODIS stations again, zoomed in. Here's our footless Swainson's thrush with a tag on. So I could tag this bird in New York during fall migration. It heads, it heads south. And therefore I don't have to place every MODIS receiver along its entire migratory route because all of the stations are working together. So all researchers and organizations placing these stations work collaboratively across the hemisphere. It's pretty amazing. So this is growing exponentially. I got involved in MODIS about 2018. And since that time, it's just grown by thousands of stations, well, not thousands of stations, but hundreds and hundreds of stations just in the last few years. You can see how many animals have been tagged. Um, it's now more than that. It's just growing every single day. Every time I give this presentation, it increases. So I'm a Midwest coordinator for MODIS, which means I just give recommendations or insight about MODIS. Here's our general plan. It's very optimistic, but the yellow ones are active stations and the orange ones are planned ones, so really trying to coordinate that work. Over the last four or five years, we've placed 19 active MODIS stations in Missouri in two latitudinal arrays, one in the north, one in the south, and then 14 more are coming on the way to fill in some of those gaps and move along our major riverways, uh, the Missouri and the Mississippi. So back in 2018, I used to give this talk when I was first telling people about MODIS, and since that time, you can see 2019, 2021, and then even 22, it's more than this. But uh, And we also have been responsible at MDC, and Missouri was the lead state on a few federal grants we got that are responsible for placing 15 new MODIS stations in the Neotropics, which is just as important because full life cycle bird conservation is a major focus of my previous job as a state ornithologist and now in this current migratory bird biologist job. So the point of this slide is just to show that many, many of our, our breeding Missouri birds migrate out of the country completely in the non-breeding season. 33% of our breeding birds leave the country completely. So I focus a lot on this work, working with international partners. This is a map of species of conservation concerns, wintering ranges overlapped to show where we can get the most conservation bang for our buck, um, helping with habitat management and conservation on the wintering grounds for many of these species. I get to work with a lot of inter international partners. I've gotten to go to Costa Rica um, to help ban birds. You can see some of our migrants here, like the red start, the red-eyed vireo, it's really in warbler. A lot of forest birds, I know not our grassland ones, but a lot of our grassland birds stay within the country um, and are experiencing uh, major declines as well. I'm gonna just skip past this to save time. Another piece of this is educating the public and partners on the decline of the North American avifauna. Um, we can see here on an image from that publication that we've lost about 29% of North America's birds since 1970. A large chunk of those are clearly grassland birds. They're our highest, most highly imperiled um, group of birds uh, declining by habitat type. Left of that central axis there in that image is negative percent change since 1970. So we've lost over 70% of our grassland birds. Um, so there are, I also try and educate folks about what they can do about that. So there's a website, 3billionbirds.org, um, just trying to tell people what they can do in the face of this large problem that can be very overwhelming. And one of those is to use native plants. Clearly in Missouri, where MPF comes into this, of course, they manage the Grow Native program. Literally three hours ago, I was on a presentation, a live presentation hosted by Fish and Wildlife Service with Dr. Doug Tallamy who is an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and he's a major proponent of natives. Most of you probably know who he is. He called out um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation and the Grow Native Program by name for the uh, Bradford Pear Buyback Program and named two Missouri landowners in ur urban and suburban areas that have transformed their lawns into native plants. I don't see that happening in Missouri without Grow Native and MPF doing all their good work to push natives and talk about how important they are. 
I also coordinate things like conservation plans, which are way less exciting to talk about, but they're very essential, bringing together partners to work on projects like that. So other duties I did as an ornithologist was bird monitoring. I managed the Great Missouri Birding Trail. I answered a lot of questions from the public and staff. And all of that is similar, working with these international partners for full life cycle work, still doing bird ID training for conservation partners in the state, helping to get money and funding to international partners and really just trying to bring partners together at the right place, right time to um, write research on conservation grants. So I know that was very fast, um, but I do just have a few pointers, mostly just to put yourself out there, ask a lot of questions, even if you feel silly and you feel like you should know the answer, but you don't. Um, I didn't get it involved enough in undergrad and even grad school, I think in extracurriculars and trainings, I've had to take a lot of grassland and native um, plant trainings in my career because it wasn't the straightest path in natural resources. So um, that's my big um, push is to put yourself out there and it can be scary, but um, it makes it easier to find your people who also have your passion and find your group. So thank you. And sorry, I went over a little bit. Okay, well, hello everybody. I am Rhonda Burnett with the Missouri Department of Conservation. And since 2005, I have been in the position of community conservation planner with the department. And since Sarah ended on some really good tips for all of you students and future interns, I will lead with my own tip, which is that you don't have to go into a position or into an opportunity already knowing everything. You won't be expected to have a comprehensive knowledge of the subject. What, you, what will benefit you is having an attitude that you really want to learn. If you really wanna learn from your mentor, if you really wanna learn from the organization that is giving you this opportunity to intern with them, that is going to go a long way. It will open up additional opportunities because mentors love working with people who wanna learn. If, if you're just there because it's a requirement and you have to, um, and your attitude shows that, then you won't actually learn as much from the opportunity. So attitude goes a long, long way. Um, I do want to uh, tell you how I got into um, the subject of landscape architecture, which is the degree that I earned as a, um, as a bachelor degree because it was um, so, sort of serendipitous in a way. I grew up in Southwest Missouri in a town, small town called Monette. And growing up, we would take these, you know, little, little trips throughout the Ozarks. And I would see the juxtaposition of the scenic landscape that was gorgeous, incredibly beautiful with development, whether it was um, older development or, or new construction, the juxtaposition of any urban development with the scenic beauty of our natural landscapes really struck me as um, being detrimental to the landscape. And I just thought as, as a young teenager, there has to be a way to develop that doesn't ruin the beauty of the Ozarks and you know, where, where I was living at the time. So I stumbled onto this idea that I could go into landscaping, that landscapes, doing landscaping was a way that I could beautify development. Well, my high school has a, a Votech school located in it. And when we were sophomores, we were given the opportunity to go and tour some of the, um, some of the classes offered by the Votech school. One of those classes that I toured was, um, was drafting. And there was an upperclassman in the drafting class who said she wanted to study landscape architecture in college. I'd never even heard of that as a degree program or as a career path, a, as a job. So I asked her what the difference between landscaping and landscape architecture was. And her, her answer, and I'll never forget it, was, there's no difference. It's just a more prestigious job title and you make more money. 
And I was like, oh, sold, sold. I, forget landscaping. I want to be a landscape architect. Now there's a lot more to it than that, but that that was what hooked me. So I am um, in my English class at senior year, we had an assignment to do, it was called an, an eye search paper. So it was basically, you have a question and you research it so that you can answer the question. So it's, you are informing yourself of the topic. So I chose the topic of landscape architecture. I thought, well, if I'm going to study this in college, I better learn more about it. And the more I learned about it, the more I just fell in love with this, this um, job, this career. So I uh, applied to various schools. I didn't care which one I went to, but at the time I thought I wanted to get a master's degree in the same um, subject as, as I would be getting my bachelor's degree in. So I looked at schools that offered both bachelor and master's programs. Um, and I, I just wanted to get out of the Midwest and see if what, um, what the different uh, characteristics or the different you know, um, stories about different regions in the country were really true. Like are New Yorkers really fast and rude and are Californians laid back, you know, and, and is Southern hospitality really a thing? So I applied to one school on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and one in the South. I wasn't interested in going to the upper Midwest. Um, it just seemed too cold. But the, uh, the school that offered to waive my out-of-state tuition and just allow me to pay in-state was Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. And so again, that was what made my decision for me, kind of that serendipitous, uh, just no real plan on my part. I just kind of stumbled into that. But um, I really lucked out because LSU has an extremely strong landscape architecture program. When you study landscape architecture, you are learning how to design both the sort of the integration of the built and the natural environments. So landscape architecture programs are divided and um, they're not all housed within the same college at every university. Some of them, like the one I attended, are located in the School of Art and Design. Others are located in a School of Agriculture. So if you're interested in this degree program, that's one thing to look at to see what the emphasis of the program will be on. So mine had a high design emphasis, but in the curriculum, you learn how to draw and read construction plans. So the three plans on this slide are ones that I've actually reviewed in the course of my work with the Department of Conservation. One shows a five acre master plan that, uh, for a planting plan. That's the top left of your screen. Directly underneath that is a large uh, detention basin. And then to the right is a, a plan for a, a parking lot layout and planting plan um, for a, a museum. So part of my, my job duties at MDC is I will review these construction documents and I will make recommendations on how the construction plans, how the, um, the, the layout of the site, the plants selected can be modified to be even more conservation friendly. So in addition to learning how to produce and read construction plans, we also were taught how to do grading plans or how to modify the shape of the, the earth. We were taught about hydrology and the flow of water through sites. We also learned about plants, um, which I didn't realize at the time, but what I was taught in college was primarily ornamental plants that were common in the retail plant trade, primarily in Southern US, um, since that's where my school is located. And then we were also taught um, just a, about basic uh, ecological principles. So my learning curve whenever I came to the department was I had, I had been taught in college how to memorize plants, how to learn about plants. I just wasn't taught plants native to Missouri or the lower Midwest. So my learning curve and I discovered this on my very first project with the department um, was to learn which plants are native to Missouri. So my first major project in my position um, 
you can see a, a rendering of it on the, the top left of your screen here. It was a stream stabilization project for a small stream in Greene County, Missouri. And I was asked to put the planting plan together for the riparian zone. I sat down and I just jotted out a list of plants that I thought would, uh, would be useful and functional for that purpose. And I cross-referenced them to the list of Missouri native plants and not a single plant was, was matched up. So I got to work studying. Um, landscape architecture also is whenever you want to convey your design to your clients, you heavily rely on graphics. So that's something else they teach you in the program. The graphics at the bottom of the screen here uh, were an effort where I was trying to consider the form of various native plants. Hopefully, if you already are familiar with native plants, you can somewhat identify those uh, from my sketches there, what they're supposed to be. But really kind of drilling down into the form of the plants and some of their other um, art elements that they exhibit. So these would be things like visual texture or color in addition to size and form. But looking at the plants and how they might fit within a designed landscape. And then the rendering on the top right was from, was it was not one that I produced, but it was one that I was given to show the client's vision for what they wanted the front of the uh, newly constructed Laura Ingalls Wilder Museum in Mansfield, Missouri to look like. They wanted a prairie scape or a prairie reconstruction in front of the museum. So they handed me the rendering and they were like, okay, please produce a planting plan to give us this look. That was the charge for that project. So I found when I first started my career with MDC, with my job here, that there was um, a lot of requests for input for educational signage. So using the, the skills taught to me in my landscape architecture program of a knowledge of construction materials and hydrology, I was able to help put together um, educational signage that was looking at how stormwater will infiltrate either through pervious pavement or infiltrate into the ground via stormwater management practices such as rain gardens. So all of these materials here on this slide were ones uh, that I helped to um, design and put together all the, the um, explanation of how these materials and how these various practices work, how they function in the landscape, so that hopefully other people will replicate these and incorporate them more throughout the design landscape here in Missouri. Then during um, my fifth year of my bachelor program, landscape architecture is a five-year undergraduate degree or a three-year master's degree. So my fifth year undergraduate program is when we had an opportunity to do study abroad. And so I was able to go over to Manchester, England, and my landscape architecture studio was paired up with a planning studio, an urban planning studio from another university in Manchester. And we did a joint program, a joint project together. And I was just so impressed by how the planning students really took into consideration the residents of this village that we were designing a project in. And I just, I really liked that. I liked the emphasis on using development regulations and policies to help guide development and incorporate um, this new design into their community. So I ended up applying for the urban planning master's program at the University, at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. So KU at the time offered a concentration um, within the urban planning program to focus on environmental and land use planning. So that was, that was the path that I took. And I've been able to incorporate the, the knowledge of the planning tools that I learned in grad school to write a manual um, for the Missouri Department of Conservation that you can see here on the screen. And you can download this manual as a PDF from the um, MDC's public website but it's a conservation planning tools for Missouri communities. It's a reference manual of all the planning development policies and practices, all those tools available today for any, any community in Missouri that has planning and zoning, or there's even some tools that can be adopted that don't require planning and zoning. 
But any tool that um, planners can put into practice that will help them better manage and benefit from natural resources. Um, so the purpose of the manual is try to be a comprehensive reference source, put every all the tools in one place for easy reference. And then of course, Grow Native Program has their model native plant ordinance that you can find on their website. So having that planning background helps me to be able to read through these ordinances and understand them and be able to recommend some of them when I work with various communities or developers. And then the sketches that you see on that screen were just um, examples that are located in that planning manual of how land can be various strategies for subdividing plots of land and how you might develop it to either be purely um, meet various objectives. So the top sketch there is purely a residential layout. The middle one shows an agroforestry community. And then the bottom layout there would be more of a um, conservation planned community. And then finally, um, maps and data analysis play heavily into my, my job. And these are tools that I learned in both of my programs in, uh, my, for my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, but very heavily on working with the planning side of it. So being able to um, view and interpret census data and demographics of people that live and work within the areas where your projects are going to be, being able to understand our natural resources. So looking at, at watershed maps, for example, and then our most recently developed data set at MDC is mapping out all the ecological sites across the state. We were the first state in the nation to do so. And all of this um, ecological site data is available on the web soil survey, which is hosted by the NRCS, by Natural Resources Conservation Service. And you can find, you can upload your area of interest or your shape file if you work with GIS and find for your community or, or your project what the ecological sites are. And that's going to tell you the land form, the historic vegetation and the um, soils or the geology of the site. So being able to work with that data and interpret it is something I use in my job pretty much every single day. And with that, I will turn it over now to Jared. Can everybody see that there? Okay. So my name is Jared Hubner. I'm the director of prairie management for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. Um, basically wildlife biologist, land manager has been my career path. Um, like Sarah had mentioned, I kind of took a, a long route to get here. I started off as pre-law at the University of Missouri. Uh, I did two years um, basically kind of with a psychology path. I almost had a, a minor in Spanish, um, really didn't like what I was doing, couldn't see myself being an attorney of any type. Um, my father-in-law at the time had worked for MDC, and um, he said, well, you like to hunt and fish, and my grades were suffering because I just wasn't interested in psychology or pre-law, um, and he said, well, why don't you, you know, start working for MDC part-time, and change your major over to at least something in biology. And so they had a fisheries and wildlife program there at, at MU. And so I pretty much had to start over. Um, I did another four years. Uh, it took, seemed like it took forever to get through six years of college, but it was, it was a really good chance for me to uh, work for MDC. I worked there for about five years hourly while I was going to college. Um, really liked what I did, liked who I worked with. Uh, was able to attend a lot of trainings and learn a lot of really useful, um, you know, things that I'm going to use on the job um, rather than just working at the local McDonald's. You know, it was very pertinent to my future career. Um, after I graduated, I was able to get a position salaried, uh, worked in Central Region for a couple of years, and then I was two years in St. Louis Region as a wildlife biologist. And then uh, kids came along and I was trying to get back to South Missouri. And that's when I took this position with MPS. So 
Um, I really, one thing that I really think helped me in my career, um, you know, whether it was getting the biologist position in St. Louis or this position was attending as many trainings as possible. MDC was a good, um, a good organization. And I'm sure all the federal organizations are too, as far as offering trainings and letting folks attend and learn as much as they can. Uh, they're not going to make you attend these trainings, but, you know, if you want to put your name on the list, you're allowed, allowed to in most cases. And I, you know, whether it was reptiles or birds or plant ID, I was always just wanting to learn more. Um, and then volunteering for special assignments. Um, I went out of state duck banding. I went out of state to help construct pens for um, the elk relocation project out in Kentucky. So, um, I went out on this wildfire trip here in central Oregon. So, um, just learning as much as you can and volunteering for all these things really helps you gain experience that you're not going to get otherwise. Um, and I, I took advantage of that. Um, another big part of my position, and this came as an hourly a lot, um, the five years while I was in college, my primary job was spraying invasive plants, uh, particularly the one shown here, Cerisia lespediza, being able to identify that and knowing the lookalikes that are native, um, knowing the chemicals and the mixing rates, uh, application techniques, timing for all these things. You're not going to learn most of this in school, but you know, as an hourly or a field technician type position, you're going to learn all these things. Um, some of it you do have to take it upon yourself to do some research because uh, things change, uh, studies come out, different chemicals work at different times, and it may not be what you learned five years ago. So um, a lot of this is kind of continuing education as you go along in your career. Prescribed burning is a really big part of my job. Um, not quite half the position, but um, at MDC, I went through level one, two, and three burn training. Um, level two, you start what's called a task book and you have to complete so many tasks and get them signed off on by uh, level three burn bosses. And then um, Jeff City has to approve your level three. And then you're able to write burn plans for conservation areas or private citizens in the state. Um, and then you have to do so many burns to keep up that certification. I also went through uh, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group and got my red card so that that enabled me to go out to Oregon on the wildfire trip that I went on. And I keep up my pack tests uh, just so I keep my red card valid every year. Uh, I don't any longer go on uh, Western wildfire trips, but um, that's something you all can do. Basically, I think as soon as you're 18 or 21, I can't remember, but you don't have to necessarily be employed by MDC to go out and do these wildfires. Um, you can get on with a local uh, volunteer fire department and uh, go to the trainings and, and participate in these, this fire, um, out-of-state fire if you wanted to. Um, but th that was really helpful in my career. Um, just knowing what fire is capable outside of Missouri um, gives you a little bit more respect for it here. Um, so that, that's been a really good learning experience for me. And then um, this one here was an urban burn. Um, this is one of our prairies up by Harrisonville, Missouri. Um, when I worked in St. Louis, I got a taste for urban burning. It's much different than the rest of the state. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that not everything is, you know, there's not a house within two miles of this place here. So um, getting that varied experience you could do through volunteer uh, volunteering with MDC, volunteering with us. Um, it kind of really helps you get more well-rounded in your career. Additional skills and knowledge. Um, one thing that I didn't think that I was going to be doing as much of is kind of the outreach and communication part of the position. Um, you know, in college, everyone's required to take, take a speech class or uh, some technical writing towards the end of their four-year degree or whatever, but just working with the public, um, especially if you go to work for a government agency, that's your primary job. It boils down to working with the public, whether it's like this youth hunt that we hosted at one of our prairies in, on a reconstruction site, um, just field tours, hikes, um, education. I 
I worked with uh, taught hunter safety classes when I worked with MDC. Um, the first few times you do it, it's going to be really nerve wracking. The first few times you get on these webinars, you're really nervous, um, but you're not going to get proficient at it until you've done it several times. Um, so, you know, starting early before you get your first real job um, would really help you those those first few years in your career. Um, so I would recommend, you know, doing as much public speaking and whether it's written communication or verbal communication, practicing that as much as you can. Um, other skills, plant ID, Rhonda mentioned this. I took a lot of plant classes in fisher, uh, my fisheries and wildlife program, but it did not prepare me for the native plant identification skills that I really needed. Even just with MDC, um, I was working with John George and Chris Newbold who are really good with plants up in central region. And they were pointing out stuff and I'm like, my gosh, I've never seen this plant in my life. And it's a real common, you know, grassland plant. And I just got out of college. I thought I knew it all. Um, so, you know, maybe being active in a native plant society or going out and doing your own study on some of this stuff, if this is really the career path you want to go down, um, at least familiarizing yourself with some of these native plants would really help you uh, get a leg up in, in the future. Um, other things. You know, right now, most of my job focuses on prairie management, grassland management, open land management, um, but you do have to have a working knowledge of the other ecosystems. We do have woodlands on our properties. We do have a small glade. We have some somewhat wetland type areas, swales, things like that. So you're going to have different vegetation types. Um, the upper left corner, that's a picture of some tree marking that we did. So we went in and marked some leaf trees on a savanna thinning project down in the boot hill that we're working on. So um, you do have to know the, the tree species, um, even if you want to be a prairie manager. Um, you know, it, you need to be well-rounded because you're going to encounter these other habitat types. And then finally, um, restoration and reconstruction um, is another pretty big part of the job. Any land manager, you're going to have to reconstruct habitats. You're going to have to restore degraded habitats. Um, so having a working knowledge of, of seeds, um, I do hand collection of seeds, mechanical collection, you have to be able to identify plants when they're basically seeded out, there's not a flower anymore and you know that that's the seed head you wanna go collect. Um, I do a lot of seed processing on my own and then uh, planting it at specific times and then managing those. A lot of this stuff you're not gonna learn in school, you learn it on the job from people like myself or others that have done it, but, um, just wanted to kind of point out these are some of the additional skills in my job. And that is all I have. Thank you very much, Jared, Sarah, and Rhonda. This is Carol David. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And thank you all three for really uh, insightful and uh, rich presentations that I hope will help everybody tuning in who is uh, studying some area of, of natural resources, especially uh, native have interest with native plants and prairie or anybody who wants to change, change careers. One thing that I noticed in all of your presentations, a common theme is initiative, taking the initiative. And um, I know also as uh, someone who is, gets to work with all of you, um, how you how you demonstrate that initiative and the work that you that you continue doing, even though you've been in your careers for 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 quite some time. So I uh, just wanted to uh, mention that, and I do encourage and, and just echo what you said because it is so important to demonstrate initiative so that employers can see that you're interested and that you want to learn more. Um, let's see, we have any questions here? Um, there was one question for Rhonda, and I think you answered this, but I, I thought maybe you could elaborate a little bit. There's a question, does landscape architecture require a degree? And you went over that, but I wonder if you could also talk about license, you know, having that you have to have a license and what that means. Sure, sure. Um, yes, so landscape architecture is a profession that is licensed, I believe in all 50 states. You, in Missouri, we have both what's called a title law and a practice law. So 
You cannot call yourself a landscape architect unless you are um, licensed by the state of Missouri and you cannot practice landscape architecture, no matter what you call yourself, but you cannot practice the profession unless you are licensed here in the state of Missouri. So to become, um, to become licensed there and registered, those are two separate things and it gets a little, it, it gets a little convoluted, but essentially there are requirements. You don't necessarily have to have a degree, a formal degree from an accredited school to become licensed, but in lieu of that formal degree, you would have to have so many years of internship or apprenticeship underneath a licensed landscape architect. And then everyone has to pass an exam. The, there's a group called CLARB, it's the Council of Landscape Architecture Registration Boards. Um, they, they administer the LARE, which is the Landscape Architecture Registration Exam. So you have to pay the fee, pass the exam, and then have the appropriate, whatever the state laws are where you want to work on projects. Um, there'll be requirements for so many years of, of professional work under the supervision of a licensed professional and then you pay the fee to become registered in, or licensed in that state. So if I wanted to work on a project in Missouri and Arkansas, I would have to be licensed in both states to work on those two different projects. Um, and then once you are a licensed registered landscape architect, you have to maintain your certification by um, by doing by participating in continuing education for landscape architects, they call theirs um, professional development hours. So you have to earn so many professional development hours or PD, PDHs within a certain number of years. And then within that time frame, there is then I believe a fee that you have to pay. So, you know, and off the top of my, and I'm sure it's different for every state, but so say within a three year period, you'd have to earn so many continuing education credits plus pay the fee to stay up to date with your credential. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot to it. Thank you. Um, one other thing that I, I noticed when you were speaking is, well, in the case of Sarah and Jared, you both went into other fields and then switched over. And I, and I think that's just, um, I think it's helpful for, for anyone who um, might not know exactly what they want to do at first, and, and it's okay, and, and that um, there are many routes to, to get to a, a career, and I think that everything that we learn going into to career isn't wasted. It's, it's added, added good training and information, and, and Rhonda, I mean, you knew pretty early on what you wanted to do, but didn't know about landscape architecture until, you know, someone told you about it. So um, I just want to, I guess, um, emphasize that it's okay to not know right at the beginning what you want to do. Um, and uh, Sarah did have a, a question in, uh, for, for Jared and Rhonda and, and, and Sarah, I'd like to know what you think too. What's, what's the favorite part of of your jobs, or maybe what's the most satisfying parts of your job? If, Me? Round of, oh, Jared, are you ready to go? Sure. Um, so probably the most favorite part of my job, probably a couple different things. So um, one thing I really liked at MDC is we could go in and do a woodland thinning project like on Whetstone Creek Conservation Area. And it was a quail emphasis area, so it had a, a big woodland, uh, upland, grassland interface there. And you could do this woodland thinning, so you're dropping a lot of trees, uh, go in and do a prescribed burn, and that very next year, the quail are already using it. So go into an area that's overgrown that the quail really just won't go into. And so you immediately see the results of your work um, within six months. So that's really nice and it, it's kind of on the same um, same line of thinking, but uh, I really like to go and burn a prairie and then go back in the spring and see the snakes come out of hibernation and they're out sunning and you get to see all the new plants that you know weren't there because that part hadn't been burned for a couple of years and things express themselves after a burn that you don't see a lot of times um, until it is burned. So 
Mm. Uh, probably doing the burns and then seeing uh, the prairie, the results the next spring is my favorite part, part right now. Thank yeah, you. It, it is amazing how fast you see things respond after you go in and do habitat improvement. In the, the city of Springfield daylighted a section of an urban stream downtown um, called Jordan Creek. So they took it out of a concrete culvert, uh, culvert that was completely, had the, the stream boxed in and buried underground. And when they removed all that concrete and restored the, the stream banks with native plants, um, I had an intern who went down to take pictures right after that project was complete. And there was a night heron who'd found a crawdad in the stream and was eating it on the banks. And it was just, it, 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 that's that wow factor of how fast nature responds when you, you know, give it its, the proper care. Um, I would say for me, my challenge working, um, I, I think it's a, oh, it, it's a blessing and a benefit that I am able to work in the entire state of Missouri but my program is very small. There's three staff people in my program. So I'm constantly being challenged with how can we leverage our staff time to provide the best possible service to the entire state. And so that's very fulfilling for me to come to develop projects like the Conservation Planning Tools Manual that with my effort, anyone in the state then can find that and download it and use it as, as a resource. So figuring out how to provide good service to the maximum amount of people um, and, and still just, you know, maintaining, maintaining a healthy life work balance <laughs> for myself. Um, that's been a very fulfilling and rewarding part of my job. Thank you, Sarah. Those are good ones. Thanks, guys. Um, I, I don't know. Mine's twofold. I'll go two since Jared did two. And it's hard to narrow it down. <laughs> but I think I think the best parts are the international aspect, the full life cycle bird conservation work that um I had a picture of Brad Jacobs on there, but I didn't mention him because I was going over time. But Brad Jacobs was the ornithologist before me, and he really brought full life cycle conservation and conserving habitat and migratory birds beyond our state and country's borders really to the forefront of state wildlife agencies. Um, and it led to the program Southern Wings, which is a way that state agencies can provide funding and support for conservation efforts abroad um, where our birds are overwintering. And so I always loved that part of my job and that's kind of what I interviewed on to get this job. And so I'm really excited that I get to focus on, on that piece of it and migration ecology. And it's just so fascinating to me um, that these tiny birds that are eight or nine or 10 grams make you know, thousands of mile journeys twice a year. Um, and they happen to live for three or four or five years and make it through all of those threats that we throw in their way. Um, and then the second part I think is just educating the public and fellow partners and colleagues about that work. I think a lot of people don't realize that a third of our birds leave the country. I don't think a lot of people realize that buying bird friendly coffee which maintains a canopy over coffee plants has a real impact and benefit for migratory birds because it leaves them foraging habitat um, down south where a lot of deforestation is occurring because of ag. As we all know in grassy landscapes up here in the US, you know, it's not just as simple as conserving land. You know, there's all these economic, socioeconomic factors that are tied up, especially with grasslands. Um, and agriculture and the same thing down in the wintering grounds for a lot of these even forest and grassland bird species so it's just all that stuff is really fascinating to me and trying to pick apart the socioeconomic factors and how can we best help partners down there how can we best support them rather than just oh well we'll just conserve some land it's not that easy so I'm trying to piece that apart and, and figuring out how we can be effective is really fun. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of questions that have come in, and um, okay. unfortunately, we have to leave at five. But I'll try to if uh, I'll try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, Gary asks for Jared and Rondo. What would be your elevator pitch or elevator statement that would fire up teenagers for reweaving the web of life with native plants? Just. Real quick, what what could you say to get teenagers excited about reweaving the web of life with native plants? And Sarah, you can answer too if you want. <laughs> I'll just share what gets me fired up because honestly, uh, 
plants were my least favorite part of landscape architecture when I studied it in school. Um, but I got super excited learning about the native plants um, on the job with MDC because for the first time I was learning about green infrastructure and how plants are performing actual work functions in the landscape that are benefiting people. So when I realized certain plants are helping us manage stormwater and other plants are helping to remediate pollutants or contaminants in the soil and other plants are providing habitat to wildlife, that they all had a job and they're really, really good at it. That's what gets me fired up. So now all of a sudden it goes beyond aesthetics and it goes to functionality and and doing a job. And that's something that I get really excited about. And it just, it just suddenly everything clicked into place. And now I love working with native plants. Great, thanks. I think uh, on top of that, you know, it is really interesting how uh, just pollinators interact with certain plants and things like honeysuckle, just our sugar to the birds, you know, the seeds on the honeysuckle are just a sugar high for a little bit and don't provide any energy down the road. Um, things like that are really interesting. But for me, I think when I see a few kids in every class that come out to the prairies and look in a burn unit in June, you know, May, June, and July, and see those plants blooming firsthand and see the bees landing on them, that's when you can really see those kids get fired up about plants. You can see them in the classroom, read about them in a book and all this. But I think, and it was that way for me, you know, when I started working at MDC, when I was dealing hands-on with these plants and going out and looking at them that's when I really started getting excited about them was in person. Thank you. Do you want anything Sarah real quick or should we move on? Well when I do the bird ID and conservation workshop every year or talk to anyone about birds I always mention native plants because it's just such an important time right now with bird declines which are likely caused many in many ways by insect declines and how tied together those are and how of course those insects need natives so I never talk about birds very often without talking about habitat, and that includes native plants for sure. Thanks. Um, just a comment from Doug that getting out of your comfort zone is very important in building your career, and I think that would be true for, for any career. So thanks for that, Doug. Um, another really um, good question that I'm, I, um, I had one idea of, and you guys might as well, do you have any advice for people who want to work with plants and the environment as a career, but have learning disorders that hinder their academic skills? Yeah, I would say that attitude and initiative go a long way. So if you need an accommodation from an employer, that can certainly be provided to the best of their ability. But if it's a matter of just you know learning skills, specific to a, a career in the environmental field, getting involved with volunteer groups and networking and making connections. If you really have a passion for it and you can meet professionals working in the area that you are interested in and build those relationships with them, then they're going to, if they're in a position to be able to create a project or a position that matches your abilities, that's, that's where that's going to start is getting out there as volunteer, building relationships, and just trying to find the right fit, the right match for your abilities and your passion with what is there. And if you can't find something that somebody will hire you to do, you can always create your own, you know, start your own business, become an entrepreneur, um, start a club or an organization and you know you make the rules then thanks Rhonda. um we have another comment um i'm currently a forensic dna analyst with degrees in biochemistry is it possible to break into a career in something like wildlife biology ecology conservation without going back to school and getting a different degree. I'm working on a certificate in natural areas management at an arboretum, but I don't think I have it in me to go back to school to start over. Uh, yeah, I mean, advice? I don't I don't see why not. Um, I know most positions at MDC, um, and I think even a lot of the federal um, agencies, you know, they require a degree and or related experience. So 
you know, start, start getting that related experience and, you know, figure out how your current position relates um, and expand upon that. So you've got the degree covered. Um, you know, Sarah's degree was in English, so, mm-hmm. or writing. So, you know, you've got to start somewhere. You may have to take a pay cut or something to get your foot in the door, but mm-hmm. I think, you know, you could advance pretty quickly after that, you know, showing some initiative and um, get, get the experience, whatever field you want to go into. So if you want to go into native plants, you know, you better know those native plants going into it. Um, so, and that's stuff you can do on your own. Yeah. You know, it took me a little while to realize that um, if you voice to people what you want, you know, in a pleasant manner, if people know where you're trying to go and you know where you're trying to go in your heart and in your brain, and you tell the people that you're interested in jobs about professionals, you call up to ask them about their job, go out in the field with people. If you, again, if you put yourself out there and tell people what you want, that really makes a big difference because there's no confusion. And I think it, most often people will help you get there if they can, you know, within their scope of influence, they'll help give you opportunities in the field, ways to volunteer. I mean, we, I do at least, I love mentoring people and helping show them different aspects of our job field. Because again, in natural resources, I never knew you could go around and look for nests and do that for a job. I didn't know probably 99% of the jobs in the natural resource field even existed. And I think that's a big piece is educating young people that this stuff even exists, that you can go outside and do fun stuff for your job. And then that passion will push you through a whole career and it'll feel fun. I just, what, one of the best things that happened when I was in MDC is a supervisor, supervisor, supervisor asked me, what's your dream job in the department? Like where, pretty much asked me, where are you trying to go? And I told her the ornithologist job and they knew that and then they could help foster me giving me projects and things to continue that passion, but also move up in advance. Thank you. And we're just about out of time. Well, we have a couple of other questions. Um, if we have time, we could address these, but I wanted to mention, so there are two questions. Could anyone speak to public horticulture as a career field? And another question, can you talk about garden design career paths that do not require a landscape architecture degree and license? for someone more interested in plants and design aesthetics rather than outdoor structures. And um, maybe in just a couple minutes, I think Rhonda, you could address those, but I wanna let everybody know that Erica has put into the chat a link to our careers page. And on that careers page, you can read more about um, the, the background of our three panelists and a number of other people who've worked with native plants and uh, prairie. And there's also an incredible document that Rhonda put together that gives really, uh, really detailed descriptions of many different kinds of jobs that might require an advanced degree or no degree, um, that and and certifications that might, you know, what what kind of work, the kind of work that you would do. It's it's really uh, informative, and I think that could help answer those two mm-hmm. questions. But here in just a couple minutes, um, Rhonda, would you like to add anything about that? Sure. Yeah. No. I I would just encourage those people to look at that uh, document because there are there is a description of both what are the job duties of a horticulturist and what are the job duties of a landscaper because landscaper is you know my first thought of what my job would be and um, that is an actual job so you don't have to be licensed um, to be to practice landscaping and and do that to do garden design and. So yeah, you can look at the job descriptions for both those two jobs, read what the educational requirements are and the licensure requirements if if they do exist. But I would just like to echo what I believe Jared and Sarah have both mentioned today is that um, public speaking skills are good. I used to give that advice to everyone I mentored, work on your public speaking. But now over the course of my career, what I really think is even more important is professional writing skills. And those seem to have been declining um, in recent years. So, and they're just vitally important to whatever position you do with conservation or the environment, writing skills are, I can't emphasize enough how important that is. So if you are weak in that area, learn it, get, take classes, get trained, ask for help because it's really, really, really important. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jared, Sarah, and Rhonda. And um, I also, I will just add to echo, I started out my career with Prairie and the Prairie Foundation as a volunteer back in 1995 or 1996. 
And so I, I, I under, uh, like to just emphasize how important it is to go out and take the initiative and, and you never know where, where it'll lead, but um, it, it uh, was, was great for me to get, get experience as a volunteer, um, which led me to my current career. So thank you all very much for speaking with us today and everyone for tuning in. Um, Erica will send a recording, uh, a, a link to a recording of the this afternoon's presentation to you along with some other links. And we have another wonderful online program for you on September 28th. It is a masterclass on dragonflies with Betsy Betros. And if you've seen her other presentations, you know how enchanting she is. And if you have not, you will be enchanted. So please join us on September 28th and everyone have a good evening. Thanks, Carol, for your boundless initiative and efforts putting these on. Oh, later. well, thank you to Erica for all her promotion and organization <laughs> of them. Great job. Good night.